For quite some time now, a lot of us have come to the agreement that the human race is the most intelligent species. After all, we've created cars, planes, the internet, highways, infrastructure, and cities. I mean, when you think about how far we've come, it truly is impressive. And the fact that we've been able to study animals and their natural habitats gives us a better understanding of what they are and aren't capable of. Some don't even have opposable thumbs the way we do, giving us a significant advantage to grasp things with our hands. That being said, it seems in certain situations, animals can be seen superior to humans in more ways than one. Today on Life's Biggest Questions, we're asking are some animals smarter than humans? Smash that like button and let's get into this one. So to start off, we need to understand what being smart even is. So the definition of smart is, I quote, having or showing a quick-witted intelligence, which to be honest, means that you naturally have or are quick with your knowledge, I guess. Let's look at the definition of intelligence, which is, I quote, the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. So in a sense, that would mean that the definition of smart is really having the ability or showing the ability to quickly acquire knowledge or skills that you could then apply, which in a sense would mean that someone who was born naturally good at playing piano or guitar could be musically smart for lack of a better word. They just understand it better than the average person. Whether it's playing or reading music, they just get it. Usually humans or society tends to measure intelligence by equations and theories. Math and science tend to be very popular categories when determining one's intelligence. However, it seems there are other types of intelligence aside from book smarts and problem solving. Now this number varies with some claiming there are eight types, others think there's nine. At one point people claimed 12 different types of intelligence exists. And I'm not going through each one to make a point, but let's just talk about emotional intelligence. Some can pick up on others' emotions much quicker, while others have high social intelligence and are able to thrive regardless of social settings. When determining someone's smarts, as previously mentioned, it seems society tends to focus on the scholastic side of things, at least when giving one an IQ test, say in school, for example. And that's all great and dandy, but even if we wanted to compare the average human IQ to that of certain animals, well, it'd be next to impossible because it's incredibly tough to understand some of these animals' cognitive skills. Aside from the fact that they don't have opposable thumbs, there's also the factor that, at points, researchers were trying to test animals' intelligence based on what they knew and assumed the animals knew the same. What do I mean by this? Well, for example, in a previous experiment, elephants were given a stick and food placed just out of their reach. The elephants failed to get the food with the stick. They knew where it was, but they wouldn't get it. It's weird, huh? They couldn't just use their trunks? Here's the thing, it turned out the elephants didn't want to use the stick with their trunks to grab the food because it would inhibit their abilities to smell and feel, which is what elephants rely on much more than their sight. Once the researchers realized that was a possibility, they altered their experiment adding a box in which the elephants immediately knew to kick until it was in a position that they could then stand on it and get their food. And this is just one of many examples of humans trying to understand animal intelligence only to let our own ignorance and bias get in the way of the experiment itself. Makes you wonder based on a lot of other previous research we've done regarding animals, how much of it could potentially be wrong? And yet another very, very important factor when determining animal versus human intelligence is the fact that humans as a society can be at an advantage or disadvantage based on social class. For example, a wealthy family who could send a young child to a private school from a very young age and give them extra time to understand material with tutors will likely lead to them growing up with a better grasp of understanding and knowledge compared to a less wealthy child or family whose parents can't afford any extracurricular studies for them, rely on the public school system to hopefully spend enough time with their child until they fully grasp the same concepts. In the animal kingdom, that's just not a thing. It's all about survival. Now you could argue humans are also made for survival. At the end of the day, any living thing is wired for it. However, it seems some humans appear to be much less intelligent than others, or are willing to risk their survival or life for well, I don't know what. A great example would be people who do crazy stunts online to gain a following or take pictures of themselves hanging off of buildings with just one hand. Seriously, it's very dangerous and could lead to death, yet there's people all over the world who do these things. Animals, on the other hand, yeah, I don't think they do things for likes or clout. And when you think of it from that angle, I mean, sure, animals don't have cars, but do they necessarily need them? Again, let's bring it back to survival here. Animals live off the land, as do humans, except we've learned to create other things in the forms of machinery or devices that can provide more than what's naturally available at a quicker rate. The only issue is that means said resources will inevitably run out at a quicker rate. So again, it really gets you thinking or questioning, are humans smarter than animals? On the surface, sure, it seems like we're the most intelligent species out there. Yet for some reason, we continue to do things, and not only do things, but actually encourage these things, that are incredibly harmful for us. We know that fast food is bad for you, yet we allow McDonald's to continue building more stores. 
That's not smart of us as the human race to allow a restaurant, if you will, known to be detrimental to our health, to continue expanding. Now that's a very specific example, of course, but even something like fuel emissions. I mean, I drive my car everywhere and I genuinely don't even think about how bad it is for the environment because I'm just so consumed with other things in my life and truthfully ignorant to the realities of it. It's also because driving has become so integrated within our society, specifically speaking in Toronto at least, that it's just normal. We're all aware it's bad to breathe in the emissions, it's bad for our city, it's bad for us not to walk and exercise and be active, but we got places to go so we just drive. Animals don't think this way. And it is possible that animals are actually much smarter than we are, but as we continue to expand as humans across the world and use natural resources that animals would be using if we weren't abusing them, well, who knows what the animal kingdom would be like? It's possible we're actually interfering or stunting with their growth and then questioning why we're so much more advanced. It's possible we've learned to adapt quicker, but over time, the animals will outlive us. I mean, only time will really tell. I mean, there's also people who do crazy sports like skydiving and even combat sports, which I personally love to watch. But again, we know the potential dangers that arise, yet we still promote and even allow it. It's very dumb of us. Animals don't have a fight club. Maybe they do and they just don't talk about it. I don't know. Regardless, at the end of the day, knowledge and intelligence really does come down to survival. And some animals, it appears, naturally know how to survive more than others. Given that humans are becoming more and more reliable on external, unnatural sources, such as the internet and our phones, well, we may be getting naturally dumber as a species. It sounds crazy, but decades ago, people would use a map or know their way around town. Nowadays, you use an app on your phone, but if your phone dies or there's no data or Wi-Fi, then what do you do? All in all, guys, I think this question needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case account, depending on which animals you compare humans to. Of the animals, it seems chimps, goats, elephants, bees, dolphins, octopuses, and crows are up there with some of the smartest. Are they all smarter than humans? Depends what you're measuring in regards to intelligence, but if you guys can't tell by now, I think at this rate, most animals are much smarter than we are at least based on what I'm seeing in the world day to day. Now, as always guys, let us know your thoughts down below. For now, let's reply to some of your comments from the video, WTF is up with deja vu. The Rebel said, when I'm having deja vu, there's always a sense of when this event happened already, like in a dream or it was already lived. Sometimes it feels like the memory is a few years old. I, when I have deja vu, I feel like, yes, it's happened before. I'm like, this, this has occurred already. I'm reliving this experiment, experience, experiment. And that's why I say life is simulation, because I'm like, this is too, it's too familiar for it not to happen already. Somewhere in the world, at some point. Tracking said, what about when you really do know what's going to happen next and have proven it to others? That's like a premonition, isn't it? Which I think is also very cool. It's like, I guess it's like telling the future, but that movie, is it Premonition, I think it was called? I think it was Sandra Bullock or Julia Roberts. I always get them confused. Either way, both very good actors. Check out the movie Premonition. Great uh, sponsorship that we're not getting paid for. Blazing Ocean said, anyone else got a deja vu from this video? I didn't, but a couple days ago I had deja vu after I saw this video that we were doing it on the channel. So maybe it's like a, a conscious thing, you think about it and then subconsciously your mind just does it because it wants to fool you. Maybe, you're, maybe your conscious and subconscious mind like, you know, go at it every now and then. That's pretty wild. Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions, the channel that looks to answer exactly those. I'm Rebecca Felgate, and today we are asking the difficult question of should we ban zoos? I remember the wonder and joy at visiting my first zoo. As a child, seeing a tiger, an elephant, a python, a giraffe, it all contributed to my wonder, love and respect of animals that I feel today. But the deaths of Tilikum the orca in 2017, the much publicized loss of Harambe in 2016 and the euthanasia of healthy giraffe Marius in Copenhagen Zoo in 2014 don't exactly paint these supposed animal loving institutions in the greatest light. So all things considered, the good, the bad and the ugly truths, do we need to get rid of zoos altogether? First off, let's have a look at the good work and positive impact of zoos. As I mentioned, as a child, zoos were a fun and eye opening place for me. Of course, this was before I had a grasp on animal cruelty, but that aside, it is a great way for children to learn about species out there in the world. It is an opportunity for children and adults alike to actually experience these species firsthand, which, if zoos didn't exist, would be a privilege saved only for kids with parents who could afford to take them on culturally rich holidays to other lands. That said, at what cost does this supposed education of the animals come? Is our desire to learn worth more than the animal's right to be free? Does this education really even exist in a tangible way. A CAP study of British zoos and aquariums found that 41% of the animals on display in captivity had no signs identifying their species, which is insane. In these cases, perhaps 
perhaps a documentary or even a series of YouTube videos could teach the child more about the animal than the zoo without a sign. Ok some zoos may be failing in the education department, but this does not apply to all who perhaps shouldn't be tarnished with the same brush. Many zoos and aquariums are funding conservation efforts which is actively trying to protect endangered species such as the northern white rhino and of course the endangered giant pandas. One zoo very involved in breeding within captivity is Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington which has recently seen the birth of a giant panda. Some argue without the intervention of zoos, some animal species would die out. Although are they really helping? Are they creating a false sense of species that are actually unfit for the wild? Of the 300 odd pandas bred in captivity, only 5 have been released into the wild, 2 of which died within a year. While conservation is excellent in theory, a 2013 study led by Dr Paul O'Donoghue, a conservation geneticist, says that actually less than 1% of zoo species are part of any serious conservation effort, and indeed those that are involved in conservation are mostly just encouraging inbreeding. It is clear that zoos and aquariums can do more. Sea Life for example, spends only 3 pennies per pound per visitor on conservation. If education and conservation are seen to be the key points in the argument for the existence of zoos, what are the counter arguments? Well first and foremost, zoos are unnatural. In order to thrive, animals need a natural habitat. In the wild, animals have around 18,000 times more space than in captivity. Living in a zoo greatly decreases the animal's lifespan. Elephants are said to live 50% of their usual life expectancy in captivity, with most of them developing walking issues and around half showing signs of behavioural problems. Tilikum, the orca at the centre of the Black Fish documentary, died aged 35 at SeaWorld in Florida. In the wild, he should have in theory lived to around 50 or 60 years old. It is easy to disassociate animals from our perception of what is right and what is wrong, but I would ask you, how would you feel if you were given a pretend house, much smaller than the one you could live in under ordinary circumstances, and were fed in front of a crowd of people? It would be like turning prisons into tourist attractions. This of course brings us to animal behaviour. There are no two ways about it, animals in captivity are stressed. Lions spend 48% of their time pacing in captivity, which is just not normal. Many animals, perhaps most drastically the polar bear, show strange ritualistic behaviour in captivity, such as head bobbing or walking into walls. Animal behavioural psychologist Dr. Vint Verga recognises these behaviours to be indicative of psychological damage. Of course, animals in captivity can also be aggressive, leading us to question whether it is even safe to have these huge animals so close to humans anyway. Since the release of Blackfish, most people know that Tilikum, with his defeated floppy fish, was involved in the death of three of his trainers, and he isn't the only animal to have struck. In fact, sadly, he is one of many. This is perhaps why zookeepers were so quick to shoot Harambe when a child fell into the gorilla enclosure in the Cincinnati Zoo. Of course, the danger posed to civilians is nothing compared to the danger and threat posed to healthy zoo animals. Shockingly, the number of healthy animals killed by zoos each year is between 3,000 and 5,000. This is according to the European Association of Zoos and Aquarium. This is exactly what happened to Marius, the Danish giraffe who was cold because of its insufficient gene pool for breeding. In South Lakes Wild Animal Park in Cumbria, UK, the past few years have seen 7 healthy lion cubs and 5 young baboons euthanised because there was simply not enough space for them. Some zoos are simply awful and poorly run, others are at least trying to make a positive change towards the life of animals, taking in only genuinely endangered species as well as stopping the enclosure of show for animals. Even SeaWorld seem to have wisened up to the level of animal cruelty they endorsed. They announced last year that their current generation of orcas will be their last and that they will phase out all orca shows by 2019. But are these positive steps enough? Should we ban zoos? Well, ask yourself this, is it ok to capture animals for our own entertainment? Is the cost of animal lives, natural habitat and psychological welfare worth it just so your child can see a tiger roam over a moat of water in the distance? Are conservationists protecting and creating more animal lives than are being taken by carelessness and culling? The answer is inconvenient and perhaps painful to some, but zoos as we know them should be banned. Perhaps there is room for more ethical animal centres 
centres where animals are looked after out of need rather than spectacle. If an animal centre could provide a better environment for its residents than in the wild, then it wouldn't even be a problem. If children and adults alike were able to learn from animals in those kinds of environments, there really wouldn't be an issue. But right now, there are several big issues. Perhaps the rest of the world needs to learn from Costa Rica's example and start dismantling zoos, instead focusing on sanctuaries where animals that need to be taken care of can receive care. So there we have it, a big question answered. Do you agree that zoos as we know them should be banned? Not gonna lie, there are some pretty terrifying creatures that currently roam the earth, such as the anaconda, the goliath tigerfish, and the goblin shark. Seriously, what is up with that last one? It looks like what would happen if you cross a human with a shark. But we aren't going to be focusing on that creature today or any other animals that are currently alive. Instead, we are going to be looking at some terrifying animals that thankfully went extinct. Or else people would be scared to leave their house. I mean, we are currently scared to leave our house, but this would just add more fear. Hey everyone, what's up and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. The voice you are currently listening to belongs to me, Lindsay Ivan, your voice of reason for today's video, which is top 10 scary animals we are glad went extinct. But before I begin, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to Life's Biggest Questions. With that being said, let's dive on into the video. Now, I wouldn't want to wish any animal extinct. But in this case, I am pretty happy that these animals are no longer around. And you'll understand why shortly. Scientists better not start messing with their DNA and try to resurrect them. Starting off this countdown, we have the Platybelodon. This animal makes me wonder if scientists accurately reconstructed this one. Because just look at him. Come on, there's no way that this was a real animal. It looks so creepy and weird. So, the platybelodon was a large mammal closely related to the elephant. It was said to roam the swamps, lakes, and rivers of Africa and Eurasia about 10 million years ago. This mammal had a long trunk and tusks like elephants, but also had a shovel for a mouth. So apparently, the platybelodon would scoop water and food through its shovel mouth. Like, it kind of reminds me of a stretched out hippo. Either way, I prefer the way our modern day elephants currently look. Coming in at number 9, we have the Gorgonops. Compared to the other creatures I'm about to mention, this one is probably one of the less scarier ones. So the Gorgonops were a species about 6 to 10 feet in length. Their skulls were anywhere from 20 to 35 centimeters long. This animal lived 260 million years ago, way before dinosaurs roamed the earth and they were thought to be a very vicious predator. They had two very large canine teeth that extended down past their lower jaw. Their teeth were one of the reasons why this beast was near the top of the food chain. Honestly, it's a pretty weird animal. The images make it look like a cross between a hippo, dinosaur, and a saber-toothed tiger. Coming in at number eight, we have the Leoplorodon. The Leoplorodons were a carnivorous beast that weighed more than 3,500 pounds, and it was longer than 30 feet. In fact, their massive skull took up one-fourth of their body. Of course, with such a big head, they had massive jaws, and numerous rows of razor-sharp teeth. Their bites were extremely powerful, and their teeth were about 20 centimeters in height. Now, there is some debate on the size of this creature. Some say it can be up to 30 feet, while others claim it was anywhere from 6.39 to 7.5 meters long. But either way, they were pretty massive and creepy looking. In our seventh spot, we have the Arthropleura. Now, this next creature isn't an animal per se, but it certainly is bigger than some. It is considered an insect, but it is just so terrifying that I had to include it on this list. So the Arthropleura was an 8.5 foot long millipede. Yep, normal size millipedes have up to 200 legs. I don't even want to know how many legs this giant one had. Now, modern millipedes are herbivores, but this one may have been carnivorous. In fact, these millipedes are so big that they had no known predators, and it was considered the largest land-dwelling invertebrate in history. Now, it's said that these insects went extinct probably because of climate change. Now, I'm not one for climate change, but in this case, I'm happy this monster is gone. On our way down the list at number six, we have the Archaeotherium. The Archaeotherium, whose name translates to ancient beast, was a tall and bulky, aggressive creature. In fact, it was often referred to as the hell pigs or pigs from hell. 
While they aren't actually related to pigs, it's due to their hog-like appearance that they got this name. In fact, it's thought that this animal is more closely related to hippos and whales. The Archaeotherium had huge jaws, strong neck muscles, and oversized skulls. Their jaws could open very wide, which suggests they could easily clamp down on their prey. In fact, they would hunt and kill prehistoric rhinos. Their large teeth towards the front of their mouth could be used to easily crush their prey's skull, while their forward canine teeth would be used to tear off and pick apart their food. In our fifth spot, we have the Dinophelis, whose name translates to terrible cat. In fact, it's said to be the most famous prehistoric big cat. This animal was thought to be anywhere from the size of a leopard to a lion. It had huge fangs and strong front legs that it would use to pin down its prey before ripping them open. Now, this cat was a little more chunky, so it wasn't fast, but it could easily trap its prey through its stealth and excellent night vision abilities. Now, here's what makes this animal terrifying. It would mainly hunt and eat humans. Well, the early form of humans. Apparently, our ancestors were easy targets. Now, what the Dinophelis would do is pounce on them and then bite into their skulls and literally crush them with their teeth. So yeah, another animal that we can keep extinct, please. Moving on to number four, we have the giant sea scorpion. The Yekalopterus, sometimes pronounced as Gekalopterus, was basically a giant sea scorpion. It was around eight feet long and had sharp pincher claws. These spiked claws were said to be around 18 inches. The Yekalopterus was said to be one of the fiercest creatures on Earth. In fact, they didn't have any predators. Now, their diet mainly consisted of large fish, but they also had a tendency to eat each other. Yep, that's right, they were cannibals. But just imagine dipping your toes into the ocean then being dragged under by one of these. Yep, yeah, that's no from me. Moving on at number three, we have the Megalodon. Of course, I'm sure a bunch of you guessed that this one was going to be on the list. If you've seen the movie The Meg, you'd see just how big and terrifying these sharks are even if it may have been an exaggeration. Well, the Meg was a 59-foot-long shark that had massive 7-foot-wide jaws. Its size is about triple the size of today's great white sharks. In their jaws were five rows of shark teeth. In fact, they had around 276 teeth. So yeah, these dudes could slice you up no problem. This shark's bite was strong enough to crush a car. In fact, their teeth were so strong that they would resist cracking even if they were to chomp down on bone. There is even evidence that suggests that they would often target and eat large whales. Can you imagine if Megs were still around? You could be out swimming peacefully and next thing you know, you're swallowed whole by this beast. In our second spot, we have the Titanoboa. If you're not a fan of snakes like me, then maybe skip this next one because this snake was massive. The Titanoboa was 50 feet long and weighed around 2,500 pounds. In fact, they were referred to as one of the biggest and baddest predators on Earth. These snakes plagued the Earth around 60 million years ago, just after dinosaurs went extinct. They were also known as crushing machines because they would wrap around their prey and crush them with ease. All reconstructed photos of the snake are terrifying. I would never want to encounter this beast. And in our number one spot, we have the Dinosuchus, aka the Mega Crocodile. The name Dinosuchus literally means terrible crocodile. And I mean, that name is pretty fitting. Although it's said to be more closely related to alligators than crocodile. Either way, this animal was pretty terrible and terrifying. Dinosuchus could grow to be around 36 feet long, and they weighed around seven tons. This animal threatened the earth around 72 to 83 million years ago. Now, here's something you won't believe. It is said that Dinosuchus would often battle dinosaurs. That's right, and they would win. Fossils of T-Rexes have revealed teeth marks from these animals. So yeah, this animal literally took on the king of dinosaurs. 
This means that their jaw had enough power to take down a huge dinosaur, like a T-Rex. Space Godzilla! The king of monsters turned into galactic, hell-bent on destroying original Godzilla and draining the Earth of its core. As a movie, Space Godzilla sounds pretty hilarious, but things wouldn't be so funny if the death dino was real, would they? Hello and welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions, the channel that likes to answer a plethora of queries on a range of topics, including science science, science fiction, space, history, politics, pop culture and beyond. I'm your host Rebecca Felgate and today I'm asking what if Space Godzilla was real? That's right, Space Godzilla. I want to hear all of your thoughts before we get into this so please do leave me a comment and let me know what you would do if Space Godzilla was real. Also while you're down there why don't you leave a thumbs up on this video and share it with a friend. If you want to connect with the team behind Life's Biggest Questions there are links to our social media in the description box. Space Godzilla. My goodness! So for those of you who aren't aware of the 1994 Japanese masterpiece, Space Godzilla is a mutant Godzilla who was already a mutant dinosaur itself in the first place. So yeah, Space Godzilla is a mutant, mutant dinosaur who came to be when Godzilla cells were brought into space and exposed to the radiation of a black hole. Sure. The mutant then destroys a space station on its way back to Earth and then hijacks the Fukukoa Tower as the power converter to turn the Earth's core into an absorbable energy source that will make it even stronger. Are you with me? Okay, glad you're up to speed. Oh, wait, and Space Godzilla has mind control powers, can fly, and can produce crystals that somehow make him stronger. Good old Space Godzilla. So if Space Godzilla was real, the first to know about it would be our mates at NASA and the International Space Station. Although, if I were aboard the ISS, I might worry considering the dino's history of space station destruction. Presumably, Space Godzilla would be first spotted by NASA, who may mislabel the mutant as an asteroid or comet. Despite being a hefty 80,000 metric tons and 250 meters in flying height, in terms of a projectile hurtling at Earth, it isn't really that big. NASA would probably leave him to it, assuming that as an asteroid it would burn up as it entered the Earth's atmosphere. Now, this would give nasty old Space Godzilla room to land. If Space Godzilla was real, I would not want to live in Japan. This space monster and its Earth-bound predecessor always seem to run right in Japan, and in the movie it is the Fukukoa Tower that Space Godzilla destroys. The Destructo Dino has an aura that causes electrical disturbances, so if it were real, it could seriously mess up the power grid, causing widespread outages. The intergalactic mutant wants to use the Earth's core to generate power to sustain itself, slowly diminishing the core's ability to heat and sustain planet Earth. While this wouldn't be a quick destruction for us, make no mistake, Space Godzilla would eventually destroy destroy the Earth if left unattended. This would mean that we would absolutely need to go into combat with the dastardly dino. In the Godzillaverse, humans unleash Mogura, a destructive robot with an arsenal of weapons. While we may not go down the robot route, the United Nations would definitely attempt to attack the pest using whatever means possible. Space Godzilla forms protective and empowering crystals, so we would need to destroy those and avoid its deathly corona beam. basically. A catastrophic heat ray. Fighting Space Godzilla would come with a number of precarious challenges, not least the fact that he can float, fly and control our minds. Our best way of defeating him is to get him on the ground and pin down his tail. His little dinosaur arms are pretty useless at fighting. We would basically need to trap him so that he was facing one direction and then shoot at him from the back. Now you don't want to go approaching his fire breathing end, so the back really is the only option here. Should we even kill him though? Well that's the question really. Really. Would we know his story or would we assume that he's an alien? If we did, would we try and negotiate with him? Would we be worried about aggravating his lineage? If humans thought that Space Godzilla was an alien, would this bring the world closer together? Alien or not? I actually think so. I've honestly always thought the only thing needed for world peace would be a recognizable external threat. What would happen when the threat is eliminated? How much damage would we need to repair? I really have to wonder about these space crystals. Would they be precious? Would we harvest them and sell them for jewelry? Or as a mineral, would it be useful to us? I'm certain that scientists would want to run tests on it to see how it's made and what it's made of. Right, now that we've mentioned the science of the whole thing, there are plenty of scientific questions here. In fact, 
I would even go as far as to call it a can of worms. For example, if Space Godzilla is real, does that mean that Godzilla is real? And if so, who created him and why? In the movies, Godzilla was spawned of radiation. Would this be the case in real life? And of course, if Space Godzilla was created with space radiation, if this is a thing, what other mutants could we make and unleash on Earth? Just to get really real for a second to end this video, Godzilla as a concept, as a science fiction mutant, came as a result of the devastating nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The monster was born from a real fear of what nuclear radiation can do, what it can destroy, and what horrors it can create. Since the nightmarish bombings, the world has staved off fighting worldwide wars for good reason. We absolutely do not want to know what horrors could come around if we ever started nuking one another again. Space Godzilla, honestly, would be the least of our worries. We are currently amid a mass extinction. We're living through the Holocene extinction, the sixth mass extinction event that we know of over the past 4.5 billion year history of our Earth. Right now, we are losing 0.1% of all species each year, with the UN suggesting that we're losing 150 species a day. So, what happens when they're all gone? Will we be the last ones standing? So, what if all of the animals went extinct, well it certainly is going that way. At a low estimate, the earth has 2 million species, and at a high estimate, 100 million. We have identified 1.8 million species out there, but we know that there are more. But for how long? If 0.1% of all species are dying each year, at the very least that's 1,800 extinctions a year, but the number could be as high as 100,000. It is thought that right now, extinction is happening between 1 to 10,000 times faster than it should be. Now the reason for the mass extinction is literally humans. Human emergence, human overhunting. We're killing animals and we are moving into their spaces. We're chopping down rainforests and we're polluting the ocean. Animals are dying and evolution simply cannot catch up. Evolution is the planet's defence against the loss of biodiversity. The process of evolution right now is far slower than the rate at which humans are causing mammals to go extinct. In fact, it is said that even if humans disappeared now, it could take between 3 to 5 million years for evolution to recover. While this is alarming to the vast majority of us who understand that we share a planet, not own it, there will be some people who think, like, so what? If we evolved to be sapient and therefore are better than other animals, who cares if they die out? I have to say, that actually hurts my heart to even say those words out loud, but that is how some people think, and who can blame them because that's kind of the nature of being a human, right? Well, even if we had a bigger right to be here and we did claim the entirety of the earth, letting all of the other animals die off at our whim, it would take some time for all of them to drop dead. However, as they did, and eventually, well, there are no animals but us left, we would be utterly screwed. So let's start off with insects, my least favourite animals. It is true that insects make humans sick. Around half a million people die from malaria each year, which is a disease spread by insects, namely mosquitoes. I have a word for mosquitoes, but because this is a family friendly channel and because we rely on YouTube monetization to run this biz, I can't say that word, but I'll give you some time to imagine what that word might be. You got it, that's right, that's what mosquitoes are. But they are necessary, they're important to aquatic ecology. Other animals eat them to survive, although if they're gonna die anyway, I really wouldn't shed any tears over those little. Oh, you guessed it right again. Worms, on the other hand, humans firsthand would be affected if insects like worms or ants died. Worms are nature's tiny little plows. They help nourish soil, and without them, crops would fail. Similarly, ants aerate soil and are most useful when it comes to the production of wheat, coffee, and chocolate. You may have heard the rumour that if bees died out, then all humans would have just four years left. I don't know about that, but I do know that bees directly pollinate 30% of the world's crops. Bees aren't the only pollinators, sure. Other insects and birds help pollinate the 80% of worldwide plant life that are classified as angiosperms. These plants are responsible for beans, potatoes, and again, wheat and nuts. If we didn't have animals to pollinate plants, we would have to rely solely on winds or generate winds or little pollination drones to do the job for us, but that sounds a lot like bees, so we may as well just keep the actual bees, right? What about wax? No more bougie candles for sale in anthropology or Joe Malone. Boo hoo. But then, there'd be no wool to keep us warm in the winter, or fur, not that I'm pro fur in any stretch of the 
imagination. Silk is spun from silkworms, and sure we can get cotton from plants, but crops would be ailing and failing through the lack of animal support. It already sounds like we're cold and hungry, and not to like state the obvious, but we wouldn't have meat to eat, or honey, or milk, or eggs, or cheese, or butter. We would be forced to be vegan, but without crop supply to feed a planet. I was going to mention that a lot of countries still use animals in agriculture too, but it hardly seems worth it. Like the whole we would literally starve thing kind of seems like the main issue here, and that's going to be very stressful. But it will be way more stressful without animal pets to keep us through the dark times. When I'm down, animals make me feel so much happier. Dogs, please, I don't want to live in a world without dogs. It is a proven fact that the vast majority of humans are calmed by certain animals like dogs, cats, and bunnies. Also, people with disabilities who need the help of a service animal would be in a bad way. Not that we wouldn't all be in the same bad way boat though. Speaking of boats, this brings me to water. Yes, I know there aren't any fish for us to eat, but there also wouldn't be any plankton, which is technically an animal. Plankton are said to be responsible for half of the world's oxygen, so breathing without animals would be an issue. So, to summarize, without animals, crops would fail, so we wouldn't be able to harvest as much plant based nutrition as we would need to feed the world in the absence of animal products. We also would struggle to generate new clothing and, yeah, you know, breathe. And again, no dogs, what's even the point? Also, we will never know what animals may have evolved next. I wonder if any of the creatures we have on Earth right now could eventually reach a point of sapience. But again, last thing I promise, this is all ignoring the fact that humans are animals too, so you know, without all animals, well, the world would just kind of be doing its thing. It would be very quiet. I wonder what would come from the bacteria. Okay. I'm done now. The world would suck, we would starve, and there'd be no puppies. Would you want to live in this world? I know I certainly wouldn't. While it's sad to be alive to witness all these animals going extinct, there's still some from millions of years ago we're probably glad we don't have to shoo off of our doorstep. They were pretty terrifying, and a lot bigger, and scalier, and wet. For some reason, they're always wet. This is a part two. You know exactly why you're here. I'm Taylor McWaters, and here are 10 more prehistoric creatures we're glad went extinct. Let's get anxious. Kicking off the list at number 10, there is a Nosaurus. There is or there isn't, because that name is misleading. No, they've been dead for 75 million years. They're for sure gone. There is a Nosaurus, fun name also known as the Reaping Lizard. It was first discovered in 1948. It could grow up to 10 meters long and weighed about 5 tons, quite the unit. But the feature that stands out the most on this long neck, raptor looking dinosaur is its massive claws. The thing's got baseball mitts for hands, it's quite intimidating. This is where the Greek gods got the name from. Therizo means to reap or to cut off. This is the Freddy Krueger of dinosaurs. Now, although its choice of meal was always a salad, it didn't shred animals up unless it had to in self defense, in which it was probably pretty easy. They would just be like, he, and then it's gone. Or a bunch of plants, he, there we go, we're eating. The first fossil was discovered in the late 1940s from a Soviet Mongolian fossil expedition, and they found the claws first, which must have been pretty intimidating because for 10 years they really had no idea what this creature was that these claws belonged to. In the early 50s, they found more bones, and eventually the pieces of the puzzle fit together, and they realized that it wasn't a turtle like they originally thought. I also love that concept art. That would have been a pretty cool turtle, but alas, it's just a larger, much more terrifying dinosaur. And before we continue on with this list, if you're loving all this dinosaur goodness, click that thumbs up. Let's give a thumbs up for the fact that none of these still exist. That's a good sign. Let's, let's keep this going. Number 9, Helicoprion. Perhaps one of the weirdest sea creatures to exist about 250 million years ago, this looks like a shark, but scientists now know that it was actually related to chimeras, which is a fish that's separated from the shark fam about 400 million years ago. This 25 foot long fish was first discovered by Andrei Zarpinsky in Russia back in 1889. He got the name Helicoprion because it translates to spiral saw. This guy found teeth fossilized in a spiral formation, which is wild to find that. He must have been scratching his head for weeks. Paleontologists all agree today that this was not part of a fin, it wasn't a wacky spinal cord like somebody who I'm talking about later on in this list. Its teeth coiled up and it was attached to the lower jaw of the fish, and its snap was the same power roughly as a crocodile. So new teeth would form and then in turn these spirals would get longer and longer and coil in. Adult fish would have four rotations in their mouths, and I thought an ingrown toenail was uncomfortable. This, oh my god, I couldn't even imagine. No thanks. Number eight, 
dire wolves. If you're from South Westeros, this one might hit close to home. About 10,000 years ago, which is pretty close compared to all the other animals on this list, dire wolves were still a thing. Now, if you've watched Game of Thrones, which you should have if you haven't, Go watch it. Go watch the whole show after you're done this. Yeah, easy. You're probably nodding your head right now or getting tissues, maybe both, I don't know. Dire wolves come in at around the same size as a gray wolf today. So it's not like a mega wolf with three heads or anything insane. There's no teeth coming out of its neck, but it did weigh a lot more. It was eating pretty good. Their jaws were much stronger, so crushing animal bones or humans weren't really a problem. They would actually hunt down and eat horses. Yeah, you know, like, Horses? After studying their teeth, that was their go-to snack. Currently, if you're in the market for seeing 400 dire wolf skulls, head to the Page Museum in Southern California. They found hundreds of thousands of these things in the library of tar pits. Dire wolves and saber-toothed cats would get stuck in these pits, and then depending on who stuck that day, the latter would then come along, eat them, and then unbeknownst to them, they were actually walking to their own similar fate. It's just people going in, eating, sinking. Going in, eating, sinking. It's horrible. Number seven, Arthoplura. These creepy crawlies translates to jointed ribs, which sounds so gross off the bat. Okay. Arthoplura were these gigantic millipedes. How gross. They would grow up to six feet long. It was the largest known invertebrate to this day. Thankfully, it is nothing bigger than this, so you can throw up once and then you're good. It ruled all over the arthropods, so any other spider, insect, crustacean was nothing compared to this horror. They roamed the land during the Paleozoic period and they would crawl around at much higher speeds than today's millipedes, which is alarming because those things literally will go around your house in like one minute. And they ate decomposing organic matter. So no, they wouldn't gobble you up if you went back in time, don't worry. The reason all these monster bugs got so large, by the way, was because 300 million years ago, oxygen made up 30% of the air, whereas now we're only sucking in 21%. We're getting hand-me-down bug air, which is awesome. So we luckily, though, don't have any monster bugs, just a dying hot planet that we have to deal with instead. Number six, Epicion. Much more than just a dog, these extinct canines were known as bone-crushing dogs. Much different than your, you know, schnauzer. They would come in at around five feet long, greatly resembling a grizzly bear. Their massive head would come in handy during all these hunts, and it had the head size of a lion, and its jaw certainly played the part as well. Lions, tigers, and bears all rolled up into one furry 300 pound sack of holy It was made to crush, literally. Its fourth premolar was enlarged, just like some hyenas. So just like bears, this thing too lived in what's now North America, and they went extinct about six million years ago, which is pretty recent considering other guys as well. Could you imagine camping and all of a sudden this thing comes in? Sorry, all of a sudden this thing runs in? No way, never, not a chance. Number five, Mega Piranha. We talked about Megalodon in part one, but here we are with another Mega. Mega Piranha, sounds like a Marvel Comics villain from the 70s, but in reality it was much worse. These things obviously were much bigger than today's piranhas. They came in at about one meter long and they ruled the water around Argentina. So six million years ago, you wouldn't want to take a late night skinny dip or else you probably wouldn't come out of the water. Its bite force was 50 times its own weight, which is scary for any fish, but when they're 30 pounds on average back then, that's some quick maths, that's gonna hurt. Its bite can outchomp Megalodon, like, come on. Even today, the word piranha makes people anxious because our modern day black piranha, sure it weighs two pounds, but its razor sharp teeth and bite force is still pretty intimidating. I'm sure Mega Piranha will be the villain in some huge blockbuster with some actor. Mega Piranha 3DDD part three or something stupid. Number four, Lynn Hennicus. If you thought a T-Rex had tiny arms, wait until you see this dude. Linhenicus monodactylus roamed the lands of Mongolia 65 million years ago. I'm a fan of this little dinosaur. It's actually always giving other dinosaurs the middle finger, which is great. So it had a little arm and one finger claw type scenario. He had ice cream cones for hands, essentially. In terms of these other monsters on this list, it's pretty small. It came in at the size of a parrot. Now this little guy would lay eggs and carve through anything that snuck into their nest. It was still a carnivore, like it was a T-Rex, Velociraptor, and this little guy, they were all coming after you. Any shape or size, you're getting pecked apart or ripped apart. I would for sure have this guy as a pet, with his little, his little cone hands just tapping around. That'd be so cute until he, you know, eats your neck. Number three, Spinosaurus. Another Jurassic Park star, and rightfully so. The largest carnivorous dinosaur of all time, even bigger than a T-Rex. Can you imagine? Oh my God. 93 million years ago, they stopped terrorizing the lands of what is now Egypt and Morocco. 
If you didn't already guess, its name translates to spine lizard, and that spine was quite long. The spine reached about seven feet tall, and the Spinosaurus itself would measure up to 60 feet long. And aside for its back, one of the most notable features is its six foot long head. Its mouth was similar to a crocodile's with straight, sharp teeth, not curved like the other ones, but like straight. So these teeth could stab right through any slippery fish, just a big skewer for a tooth. That being said, paleontologists from the University of Pennsylvania believe that this guy used to swim as well. Because where the first Spinosaurus fossils were found, that used to be the Bahara Oasis Desert in Egypt, which was a massive swamp. Water or land, I want nothing to do with this thing. And neither did all the people in Jurassic Park. They're like, this guy's gonna kill us, let's get out of here. Number two, the devil frog. Catching frogs is a fun way to pass the time as a kid. You grab it and you're like, oh, and then it hops away, it's magical. But 68 million years ago, if you saw a frog, you would have to stay far away from it or else you would probably lose all of your fingers and hands. It was a lot bigger than frogs today, as most of these things are. It was on average the same size as a beach ball and they lived on the island of Madagascar. Now they thrived there because no theropod dinosaurs could get there. Like if that little guy with the horns for hands came along, he wouldn't stand a chance. Its bite is similar to that of a wolf or a tiger, which is remarkable considering its size. Recently, however, researchers found a fossil of the devil frog and they believe that it once had spikes and a turtle-like shell. As if the devil frog couldn't get any cooler, now you gotta add spikes. Sick. Right now we have the horned frog, which is a lot smaller, but even after this many million years of evolution, its jaw is also remarkably strong. It can still take your fingers. And finally, number one, the Carnotaurus. When I watched that Disney's dinosaur movie in theaters, I cried when this dude came out. It was way too scary. I was not ready, and neither were the animals that had the misfortune of crossing this thing's path 69 million years ago. Nice. They were around the same size as the T-Rex. They came in at like 29 feet long, but they're nicknamed meat-eating bulls. They would run at about 25 miles an hour. They're one of the fastest and largest moving theropods to ever live. Its arms were smaller than that of a T-Rex, but honestly, it didn't matter because this one has horns like a bull, hence the meat-eating bull alias. It was discovered in 1984 by Jose Bonaparte in Argentina. Now they've only discovered one skeleton of this thing, so hopefully there weren't too many of these things poking around, literally poking around. Guys, those are 10 more prehistoric creatures that are no longer with us, gladly. And honestly, as fascinating as these things are, I get itchy talking about them. So let's leave these ones in the past.